All right. So these are the types of radioactive decay that we went over uh, towards the end of the last lecture. And um, this is a summary of all of them on one page. So if we're talking about alpha decay, well, what's alpha decay? Well, an alpha particle is simply a helium nucleus. It's got two protons and two neutrons. And when we lose a helium nucleus or an alpha particle, um, what's going to happen to our atomic number and to our atomic mass? Well, our mass is going to decrease by four and our atomic number is going to decrease by two. So we get a change in the nucleus, right? That's the whole point behind nuclear chemistry. If we have a beta decay, that's where we lose a beta particle, which has the same mass and charge as an electron. It's basically a fast moving electron. Now, our mass number doesn't change. However, our atomic number increases by one. And so this is the same as a neutron being converted into a proton. That's the overall effect of beta decay. We talked about gamma decay, which is sometimes called gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is simply where an atom that exists in an excited nuclear state emits a gamma ray, which is a type of electromag electromagnetic radiation. So it's very highly energetic. And we don't change the mass number. We don't change the atomic number. We just go from that excited state, which we oftentimes denote with a star like this, and then we go to the um, relaxed state. For, okay, so then we have the last two, which are positron emission or electron capture. So positron emission is obviously the emission of a positron, which is essentially a positively charged electron, which is a type of antimatter. I'm not going to ask you about that. But what happens is that our mass number doesn't change, but our atomic number decreases by one. So this is the same thing as basically a proton being converted into a neutron and then electron capture this is where we take an inner shell electron that gets absorbed by the nucleus and so again our mass number doesn't change but again our atomic number decreases by one so it has the same effect as a proton being converted into a neutron and again these are the types of radioactive decay that you have to know and you have to know how to balance reactions that involve radioactive decay. We looked at a few examples during our first lecture on nuclear chemistry and be sure that you know um, not only the types of radioactive decay, but you know all of the different symbols for an alpha particle, a beta particle, a positron, okay, and how to represent a gamma ray simply by using the Greek letter gamma. Well, there's all kinds of different ways that nuclides can undergo radioactive decay. So a radioactive decay series, it says here that the naturally occurring radioactive isotopes of the heaviest elements, you remember when we get higher than iron 56, okay, when we look at the nuclear binding energy per, um, per nucleon, we saw that the nuclear binding energy decreased as we went from iron 56 and went into higher um, um, or heavier elements. We saw that those elements undergo fission. What does that mean? They break apart, right? They fall apart, they decay, and they undergo disintegrations or decays to form a lighter elements that are going to have a higher nuclear binding energy. And so when we have a whole um, series of dis successive disintegrations or decays for one species in the chain, we call that a radioactive decay series. Now, the only one that I'm going to ask you to have memorized for your exam is the decay of uranium-238. So if we have uranium-238, and it will decay into lead-206. So lead-206. Okay, now, if you're wondering, Mr. Dion, why didn't you write out, you know, plus a beta particle or something like that? It's because the uranium undergoes several decays, right? It undergoes how many alpha decays? It has 14 successive steps. It's got, it undergoes, each one of these green lines represents an alpha decay, and it undergoes a total of eight alpha decays. Each one of these little orange lines represents a beta decay, and it undergoes six of those. So I'm not going to ask you to balance the reaction, okay, the nuclear reaction that's occurring here. However, what I want you to know is that if you start with, let's say, one mole of uranium-238, it is going to decay to give you one mole of lead-206. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. 
this radioactive decay series. And we're going to use this in uh, a problem that we're going to look at later on. And again, the whole idea here is that we're going from a heavier element to a lighter element. And what's going to happen is we go from this heavier element to the lighter element, since uranium and lead both weigh more than iron 56, that when we go from the heavier element to the lighter element, that the nuclear binding energy per nucleon is going to increase. So we start with something that's less stable and it decays, right? Less stable and it decays into something more stable. So we could even pencil that in here, less stable, and we end up with something that is more stable in the end. And that's the whole point behind radioactive decay is to make something that's more stable. Now, again, I told you that later on, we're going to look at an example where we look at uranium decay into lead 206, and we're going to apply the principles that we looked at in this slide. Well, how long do these radioactive decays take to happen, right? How long does it take for, you know, uh, a nuclide to decay into another nuclide? Well, as you can imagine, some radioactive decays are fast, other ones are slow. But the kinetics follows first order kinetics. So if you remember when we looked at kinetics way back in chapter 12, so this is chapter 12 chemistry, we looked at zero order reactions, first order reactions, and second order reactions. So we're going to review our first order kinetics. We're right going back, we're, we're going right back to the first chapter that we looked at. Now, what happens when a nuclide undergoes decay? We start with the parent, okay? And we represent that, or the, uh, sorry, the, the starting number of, of nuclei, and we could represent that by the letter N. So this simply represents the number of nuclei, okay? It's the same as, you know, concentration in chapter 12. And then the number of nuclei that we start with is going to undergo decay to give us a number of daughter nuclei. Now, each radioactive nuclide is going to have some kind of characteristic half-life. Again, some half-lives are really fast and some are really short. And a half-life is nothing more than the time that it takes for half of an atom in a sample to decay. All right, if you move ahead to this next slide here, this shows the uh, the half-life of cobalt-60. Now, the cobalt, the, sorry, the half-life of cobalt-60, sorry, I'm having problems with my MacBook here. Anyhow, the half-life of cobalt-60 is 5.27 years. So what happens if we start with 10 grams of cobalt-60 and we wait 5.27 years? That's one half-life. It's going to divide in half. 10 divided by 2 gives you 5. What happens if you wait another 5.27 years? Five divided by a half is 2.5. We divide that by a half for four half-lives. We got 1.25 and we do it again for 0.625. So that's all a half-life means. It's the amount of time it takes for half of the sample to decay. Well, let's go back to our first order rate law and the kinetics of radioactive decay, which again is a first order process. So again, this is first order. So you remember that in chapter 12, we talked about rate constants, right? And we said that the rate is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration. Now that was what we, what we looked at in chapter 12. But here, when we're talking about radioactive decay, we're going to say that our reaction rate, the rate of decay, okay, is going to be equal to lambda multiplied by n. Lambda is the decay constant. It's the same thing as the rate constant. And the units of the rate constant or the decay constant are going to be time uh, or reciprocal units of time. So it could be reciprocal seconds or reciprocal minutes or reciprocal hours or it could be reciprocal years, whatever. It could be any one of those, right? Because we know that rate will be in concentration per unit time in chapter 12, and rate here is going to be equal to the decay constant, which is going to be in units or uh, reciprocal units of time. So let's say, for example, it was reciprocal seconds multiplied by the number of nuclei that we're starting out with. So number of nuclei, I'm going to run a space here. Anyhow, when you multiply those, what do you get? you get the number of nuclei per second, right? That's the rate. Again, relating this to chapter 12, we talked about concentration or moles per liter per second. 
Okay, but now we're talking about the number of nuclei per second that are going to undergo radioactive decay. Well, again, I'm not going to rehash everything that we learned in chapter 12, but you know the first order rate law. So rate is equal to K multiplied by the concentration of A to the power of one. We get the integrated rate laws being the ln of A is equal to the ln of the original amount of A. And again, we're talking concentrations. This is a review of chapter 12, um, which is equal to negative KT. And we said that the half-life is equal to the ln of two divided by K. Okay, so in chapter 12, K was, say, for example, to seconds to the minus one, but K now is not K, it's lambda, which is our DK constant. So this is just a chapter 12 review over here. Oops. So the, again, this is what we learned in chapter 12. So now we're going to take that integrated rate law and we're just going to solve it. And we're going to say the ln of the initial number, or sorry, the ln of the number of nuclei that we're left over with divided by the initial number of nuclei is going to be equal to the negative of the decay constant multiplied by time, right? All I'm doing is rearranging this formula, but instead of using concentration of A and the initial concentration of A, I'm using the initial number of nuclei and the number of nuclei after a certain amount of time, okay? And of course, my half-life, right? When in chapter 12, it was equal to the ln of two over the rate constant. Here, it's going to be equal to the ln of two, which is 0.693 divided by the decay constant, all right? And we've already discussed what half-life is, right? So here is the concept of half-life that we've already looked at. And let's use what we've learned to see if we can solve a problem. This is example 25.1. If you follow along with me, you're going to see that if you understood how to, you, how to apply the first order rate law and the first order half-life in chapter 12, that it's not that much of a stretch to solve a problem like this. So it says you get cobalt 60 and it undergoes decay to produce nickel 60 and it has a half-life of 5.27 years, right? That's what we saw in the last slide. So we know that our half-life, our T1 half is equal to 5.27 years. Now, again, the last one or the last slide, I was kind of using seconds to the minus one as my unit, but again, it could be any of these. It's just a unit of time to the power of negative one. So here it's in years. All right, so there's my half-life. Now it says, what is the decay constant for the radioactive disintegration of cobalt-60? Well, we know that our half-life is equal to the ln of two, which is 0 0.693, right? Take your calculator. If you put in two, and this is just, you know, a refresher of chapter 12, Take two, and then you press your natural logarithm, you get 0.693 divided by the decay constant. So if we solve for our decay constant, it's going to be equal to 0 0.693 divided by the half-life. My decay constant is going to be equal to 0 0.693 divided by 5.27 years. Take 0.693 divided by 5.27 in your calculator, and you end up with your decay constant as being 0 0.131 years to the minus one. So there's my decay constant. And I'm going to need my decay constant in order to apply the integrated rate law, won't I? All right, so let's take a look at B. In B, it says, what calculate the fraction of the cobalt-60 isotope that remains after 15 years? Well, you can kind of do a rough estimation here, can't you? You look at 15 years, it kind of looks like to me like it's it's a it's less than three half-lives, but it's around three half-lives, right? So we should have something like, you know, less than, um, or sorry, if it's three half-lives, we would divide by half, so that would be 50%, then 25%, then it's going to be, you know, 25 divided by two, so something like 13, okay? But since it's less than that, it should be more than 13% left over. Anyhow, that's just some quick mental math. You don't have to solve this by mental math by any stretch of the means. But we're going to use the formula that I had a couple of slides ago, which is the natural logarithm of the number of nuclei that we have after a period of time. And we'll say that the T is equal to 15 years, okay, divided by the original amount of cobalt 60 that we have is going to be equal to the negative of the decay constant multiplied by time. So what we're looking for is the ratio of the amount of cobalt that's left after the 15 years divided by the initial amount. So we're solving for what I have in the blue circle. Let's rearrange the formula and we'll say the NT 
at time is equal to 15 years divided by the original amount is equal to e to the power of negative delta, or sorry, uh, lambda multiplied by the temperature, right? All I did was take the anti-natural log, so there we go. Now I can plug some numbers into my equation. I can just say that e is equal to the negative of 0 0.131 years to the minus 1 multiplied by 15 years. I punch that spinach into my calculator, and I get that the number of nuclei at 15 years divided by the initial amount, okay, is equal to 0 0.140. So I started out with one and I end up with 0.14. So that is equal to 14%, right? I just multiplied by 100. So I end up with 14% or 0.14. Either one would be acceptable, okay? And that was uh, tied into my estimation, which I said it should be greater than 13%, right? It's just kind of a back of a napkin calculation. Well, let's take what we learned in these first two problems and say, um, if we or see if we can answer question C. It says, how long does it take for a sample of cobalt to disintegrate to the extent that you have only 2% of the original amount? Well, in order to solve that problem, I'm going to go right back to the formula that I used in the last problem, where I had that the natural logarithm of the amount that I have after a certain amount of time divided by the initial amount is equal to the negative of the decay constant multiplied by T. So what I'm saying is that I'm starting with an initial amount, I'm gonna call it one, and after a certain amount of time, I have 2%. What's 2% of one? 2% of one is 0 0.02, right? That's all I did was, you know, multiply it by two over 100. If you take one, multiply by two, divide by 100, you get 0 0.02. So now I have my amount that I have after my certain amount of time, I have my initial amount, I have my decay constant, and now all I have to do is solve for T. I rearrange my formula to get that T is going to be equal to the natural logarithm of the amount I have over my after my amount of time divided by the initial amount of cobalt that I have divided by the negative of the decay constant, right? All I did was rearrange this formula and solve for T. Nothing more than that. Well, let's plug some numbers into our formula now. So we have the time is going to be equal to the natural logarithm of 0 0.02 divided by 1, which is the log of 0 0.02 divided by negative 0 0.131 years to the minus 1. That's going to give me a T of, and I'm just going to check it here. There we go, divided by 0.131 negative, and I end up with 29.9 years as the amount of time it's going to take for my sample of cobalt to disintegrate to 2%. Look, if you don't want to substitute in numbers like this, 1 and 0 0.02, I mean, you can take any original mass. You can say I start with 100 grams and I end up with, you know, you can put 100 grams and then say I end up with 2 grams, right? That's 2% of 100. Either way, you're going to get the exact same answer, right? Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the first order decay. Is the kinetics of radioactive decay as being first order. A little bit of review of chapter 12 and applying the first order rate law. Yes, no toaster. Is anybody there? All right, great, great, very good. Again, you know, all we're really doing here is applying concepts that we learn in chapter 12, right? Nothing more than applying concepts that we learn in chapter 12. Well, let's talk about radiocarbon dating. I'm sure that all of you have heard of carbon dating before. And carbon dating involves nuclear chemistry. It's why it's covered in this chapter. And what radiocar or radiocarbon dating, which we oftentimes just simply call, you know, carbon dating, all it is, is the estimation of the age of an object through the measurement of the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 inside that object, okay? Now, the object has to be made from something that was living, okay? And I'm going to explain that, uh, explain that in a second, okay? So, what happens is carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope, okay? Now, carbon-14 is produced in our atmosphere, and it says that you have, you know, high-speed neutrons that are constantly bombarding nitrogen to produce 
carbon-14. So what that means is that cosmic radiation is basically blasting neutrons at nitrogen in the atmosphere, and it ends up producing some carbon-14. So the, the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere is relatively constant. Now, what would carbon-14 be used for, the carbon-14 in our atmosphere? Well, you guys know what photosynthesis is, right? We know that living systems are continually taking in carbon dioxide, right? So if living systems are continually taking in CO2 and the carbon atoms in the CO2 can have carbon-12, right, carbon-12, and they also have a certain amount of carbon-14 that remains constant, okay, that means that as the living system is always taking in CO2, it always has that constant ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. Well, we know that carbon-12 is a stable isotope, okay? It's stable. However, since carbon-14 is radioactive, radioactive, once the living organism dies, the intake of carbon-14 ceases, right? There's no more intake of carbon-12 or carbon-14, but what's gonna happen? The ratio of the carbon-12 to the carbon-14 stayed constant while the organism was living, but what happens is, once the organism dies and starts taking in CO2, since the carbon-14 is radioactive, it's going to undergo beta decay to produce nitrogen-14, and therefore the ratio or the amount of the carbon-14 is going to get lower and lower and lower over time. Now, in order for us to be able to um, determine how old a substance is, we have to know the half-life of carbon. The half-life of carbon is around 5,730 years. And again, since that carbon-12 doesn't decay, the ratio of the carbon-12 to carbon-14 is going to change over time. And just by evaluating the ratio of those two isotopes, we can estimate the age of an artifact. However, there is a limitation to carbon dating. We can't use carbon dating to date substances that are more than 50,000 years old, which is approximately nine half-lives. That is the, um, the limitation on carbon dating. Now, this is a figure that I took from our textbook. Um, I've seen a lot of figures that deal with carbon dating in my life, but I thought this one was actually pretty darn cool, okay? Um, you have the sun, right? You have the cosmic rays that um, causes the, the neutrons to bombard the, um, the uh, carbon-14, and then you, or sorry, the nitrogen-14, rather, to make carbon-14. So we have some carbon-14 in the atmosphere, yeah, we also have carbon-13, which is 1% of all carbons, but that's neither here nor there. Um, anyhow, so you consume a constant ratio of carbon-14 and carbon-12, but then when you die or when an organism dies, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 is going to decrease, right? Because carbon-14 is radioactive and the amount is going to decrease over time and therefore we can um, date the, um, the object. All right, kind of cool, huh? Carbon-14 dating, very cool. It's also how they determine the, roughly determine the age of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know if any of you are into the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it was a big thing, a lot of, you know, a number of years ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it comes up in the news, you know, every now and again, and they're dated, what, between 100 BC and 50 AD, so kind of interesting stuff there. Anyhow, let's see if we can answer a question that involves um, dating. It says here, a tiny piece of paper produced from formerly living plant matter, right? So plants are con continually taking in carbon dioxide. Same thing with your shirt, right? If your shirt is made of cotton, cotton is made of cellulose, which is comes from the cotton fibers, which is a plant, right? So you could also use that. So for example, in another chemistry textbook, I saw the Shroud of Turin. I don't know if any of you know what the Shroud of Turin is, but anyhow, they did carbon dating on it. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there. Where was I? A tiny piece of paper that came from living plant matter taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls, has an activity of 10.8 disintegrations per minute per gram of carbon. If initially carbon-14 has an activity of 13.6 disintegrations per minute per gram of carbon, estimate the age of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so instead of the number of nuclei, right, our ends, we're going to use the disintegrations per minute here. So we want to use, I'll just write it down here. We want to use our formula, um, the ln of nt over the original amount. It's going to be equal to the negative of the decay constant multiplied by t. Well, we're going to use um, 
instead of NT, we're going to say that that's the initial rate or the, sorry, the rate after a certain amount of time. So we'll call that rate at T and then the initial amount, we'll say that's the initial rate. So rate zero like that. Anyhow, so we know that the um, rate after a certain amount of time is 10.8, you know, disintegrations per, per minute per gram. And for the initial rate, it's what? It was 13.6, and the units aren't really important because they're going to cancel out anyhow. But in order for us to be able to um, apply the formula and able to calculate and, and be able to calculate the amount of time it took uh, for the rate of disintegrations to drop from 13.6 to 10.8, we need to solve for the decay constant first. And so I told you here that the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So what are we going to use? We're going to say that T1 half is equal to the ln of 2 divided by the decay constant. We're going to say the decay constant is equal to the ln of 2 divided by the half-life, which is equal to ln of 2 divided by 5,730 years. We get that our decay constant is is equal to 1.21 times 10 to the negative 4 years to the minus 1. Again, the decay constant is just like a rate constant. Now we can solve for our time, or sorry, um, yeah, for our time. So now we're going to use the black pen, and we'll say that our time is going to be equal to the negative 1 over the decay constant multiplied by the ln of the rate after a certain amount of time divided by the initial rate, like that. So we get that our time is equal to negative 1 divided by 1 1.21 times 10 to the negative 4 years to the minus 1. So all of that multiplied by the ln of 10.8 divided by 13.6, which gives us a negative number, of course. Negative times a negative gives you a positive. You have reciprocal years in the denominator. And so when you solve for T, take this. We end up with, uh, I could simplify it to negative one divided by 1.21 times 10 to the negative four years. And you might want to check my math on this. I didn't look at the answer. Multiplied by negative 2.31 times 10 to the negative 1, like that. And when you multiply that out, you end up with your time as being 1.91 times 10 to the power of 3 years, which is the same thing as what? 1,910 years. Yeah. There we go. So it takes around 1,910 years. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, so you take, what are we now? When was this textbook written? 10, subtract 19. That puts it at what? 111 AD? It's pretty good. What did it say on the slide back here? It said uh, 50 AD. Anyhow, close enough, right? Uh, I guess that this tiny piece of paper must have been taken out of the Dead Sea Scrolls when? Maybe, in the, I guess, in the 60s, right? <laughs> Anyhow. It is very cool, isn't it? It's really cool. Anyhow, there's always somebody in the class who's really fascinated by carbon dating, and I don't blame them at all. I've actually picked another problem here that I thought would be interesting to look at. This one um, deals doesn't deal with uh, carbon dating. This one de deals with the radioactive decay series. Remember I showed you this just a few slides ago, and I'll refresh your memory, the radioactive decay series. Decay series. Right. I told you that when you have uranium-238, right, it decays into lead-206. And I told you that the stoichiometric ratio is one to one. Right, If you have, let's say, one mole of this, you're going to end up with one mole of that. So I want you to keep that in mind. You need that in order to solve this problem. Uh, and again, this is the only radioactive decay series that I'll expect you to know. And I don't expect you to know all the different steps of the decay. Absolutely not. All I want you to know is that if you start it with one mole of uranium-238, you're going to end up with one mole of lead-206. That's it. 
There are other radioactive decay series that the book mentions. This is the one that's going to come up the most, you know, for anybody who, you know, wants to maybe write an MCAT exam or a PCAT or something like that. This is the one that's going to come up the most. Okay, so let's see here. It says you get an igneous rock. It contains a little bit of uranium-238. So you get 9.58 times 10 to the negative 5 grams of uranium-238. And it's got 2.51 times 10 to the negative 5 grams of lead-206. And much, much smaller amounts of lead-208. Okay, determine the approximate time at which the rock formed. Okay, so we need to figure out the total number of moles of uranium uh, uranium 238 that we started out with, right? We can take this mass of, where's my pen? We can take this mass of uranium 238. We can calculate the number of moles. We can take this mass of lead 206 and calculate the number of moles of it. But if we tally them up, then we get the initial number of moles of uranium 238 that we started out with. Why? Because the decay of uranium 238 to 230 or to, to lead 206 is a one to one ratio. Okay, so let's start by figuring the number of moles of each. So the amount of uranium that we have after our certain amount of time, so the n uh, at certain amount of time of uranium 238 is going to be equal to how much is it? 9.58 times 10 to the negative 5 grams. We know that one mole of Uranium has a molar mass of around 238.03 grams of uranium like that. So grams cancel out. And I'm left over with, what do I get? 4.02 times 10 to the negative 7 moles of uranium. And that is the amount that we ended up with after the approximate time, right? We're trying to figure out what T is, okay? We're trying to solve for T. T is equal to something. Well, what's the amount of lead that's formed? So the number of moles, so I'll use lowercase and the number of moles of lead is equal to, what do we start it with? 2.51 times 10 to the negative 5 grams multiplied by one mole of lead weighs 207.2. So I'm just looking at the periodic table on my wall. Grams cancel out, and we're left over with the number of moles of lead. So 1.21 times 10 to the negative 7 moles of lead. And again, since for every one mole of lead that's produced, I started with one mole, one mole of uranium, right? I can just do dimensional analysis here, and I know that the same amount of moles of uranium were lost at the beginning, right? So that means that the total amount of uh, uranium, my initial amount of uranium that I started out with, I'll call it NO of uranium, is equal to 4.02 times 10 to the negative seven moles plus 1.21 times 10 to the negative seven moles. Okay, so this is what I started out with. I've already tallied it up. It's 5.23 times 10 to the negative seven. So 5.23 times 10 to the negative 7 moles. Okay, I know we haven't finished the problem, but give me a thumbs up if you follow me up till this to this part. We've solved for the a number of moles of uranium after the amount of time, and we also have the initial amount of uranium that we started out with. Cha? Okay, because from here on out, I feel like the problem isn't that difficult to figure out, and I don't like to say that very often. But I just want to make sure that you're with me on this part. Okay, cool. Good. Great. Thanks, you guys. So now we can use our formula, which is the natural logarithm of the amount after the certain amount of time divided by the initial amount is equal to the negative of the decay constant multiplied by T. We want to solve for T, don't we? Uh, we're missing one more thing, though, aren't we? We need to solve for the decay constant, we didn't do that. So let's do that now. Our decay constant, I'm just gonna skip a step here and show you the rearranged formula is equal to 0 0.693 divided by the half-life. So 0 0.693 divided by the half-life, which is 4.5 times 10 to the power of nine years. When we do that, we end up with 1.54 
times 10 to the negative 10 years uh, to the negative one as being our decay constant. So we got that now. Now we're in the end game. We've got everything that we need to solve for t. Well, in the last problem, we already rearranged the formula for t, so I'll just write that down again. t, sorry, t is equal to the negative of 1 over the decay constant multiplied by the natural logarithm of the amount of uranium after the amount of time divided by the initial amount of uranium. We just plug in our numbers. We have negative 1 divided by 1.54 times 10 to the negative 10 years to the negative 1. All that multiplied by the natural logarithm of 4.02 times 10 to the negative 7 moles divided by 5.23 times 10 to the negative 7 moles. This cancels. And I end up with a time that is a big, big number, isn't it? It's 1.71 times 10 to the power of 9 years. And remember that 10 to the power of 9 is a billion. And so the rock is about, you know, it's around 1.7 billion years old. Billion years old. My dad's brother, his youngest brother, there's 17 years between them, uh, his youngest brother did a, uh, has, a, has a geology degree. My uncle has a geology degree. And I remember my uncle was in university, you know, and he was studying rocks, obviously, doing a geology degree. And he had some rocks in the house one time. And he had these rocks all set up, and he was looking at them. And uh, my dad said, you know, how old are these rocks? And my uncle said, oh, this one's, you know, this many billion years old. This one's 10 billion years old. This one's 20 billion years old. And my dad just said, you know what? If you had it just told me they were old, that would have been good enough. All right. Well, that's cool, Allison. That's great. Rocks are very cool. Okay. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot to be learned from a geologist, right? I'm sure a chemist could learn a lot by talking to a geologist. Anyhow, section 21.4 deals with transmutation and nuclear energy.